This is Alex Generous from KREB Radio, and today I'm going to be talking about measles vectors. And in the top right hand corner, you'll see a nice picture of measles virus. Uh, these are some other viruses that are used as vectors, but again, focus today measles vector. So, basic ideas here what is measles? Why did we change it? How can it be changed? And then a case study in uh, hemagglutinin and engineering to retarget entry into a specific cell type. So, what is measles? Uh, we'll look at the particle in the genome, its life cycle, and its pathogenesis. So, the measles virus is in paramyxoviridae, uh, paramyxoviruses, and then its genus is morbillivirus. So, if you hear either of those, usually going to be referring to measles or a closely related virus. But you already uh, know how nomenclature works. Uh, size is 100 to 300 nanometers. Uh, the reason it varies is because it's pleomorphic, and that means that it can take any shape. Essentially, it's like if you took a uh, a bag or a bag. I'm sorry, that's my Minnesota accent coming out. And it can morph into basically any size you want. Pleo means some type of many, and then morphic means shape. Uh, or pleo probably refers to like having a plastic shape. Uh, nucleocapsid is N, and you'll notice how that's all over the genome. And that's what nucleocapsid does. It just holds the genome, otherwise when it got into the cell, the innate immune system would sense it and uh, start to react. Phosphoprotein uh, is also on the genome. It's not as pre ever present as the nucleocapsid or as ubiquitous. Polymerase, uh, polymerase is attached to it and then during replication it will start to replicate, which makes sense. Matrix protein, this lines the uh, inner envelope, uh, and it appears to be important for spread, which uh, a friend of mine actually is currently working on for her thesis. And then fusion. So the H and F, the H refers to hemagglutinin. This attaches to the target cell type, so it can uh, bind to SLAM or Nectin-4, and the fusion protein triggers the envelope to fuse with the uh, target cell. Uh, you can see in the bottom this genome, uh, negative stranded RNA genomes, they'll get turned into uh, positive strands to be transcribed with the uh, RNA polymerase starting up here, and uh, it falls off between each gene, so there's way more N made than L, which makes sense because you only need enough L to replicate, you don't need a whole ton of it whereas you need a whole bunch of H and S on each genome, but you need way more N than anything else because you have to cover the entire genome. Uh, this is just a brief thing about the life cycle. It's negative sense uh, single-stranded RNA. It's got a helical uh, genome, and then you have uh, L protein. So you have RNP is ribonucleoprotein complex. And that's the... Uh, having this and, and the phosphoprotein. And then polymerase, they're counting as separate. I've seen some people call it the same thing, but I assume as this was made by an actual measles virologist that for measles in particular, it's counted as separate. Measles virus will come from wherever. It will then attach to uh, CD46 or CD150 uh, or Nectin-4 then the uh, en outer envelope will fuse, which they don't have a good picture of, but essentially this envelope, oh, sorry, this envelope region becomes part of the, uh, this cell envelope and releases the virion genome, which has mRNA synthesized, and then these mRNAs code for things such as the capsid, the translational uh, modifications that need to happen. Uh, you'll get rep after this first set of transcripts. You'll start to get replication of the genome. Uh, then it will be uh, it'll be go through a positive strand intermediate, but the actual final genome is negative stranded. Then that's encapsidated, and then buds uh, with matrix lining this inner portion. H and F are exported to the cell surface, and so that the budding will supply those 
nucleic capsid, um, and uh, the L-protein are all associated with the genome when it's going out. Uh, pathogenesis. So measles is the most pathogenic virus known in the world. Uh, basically the most pathogenic disease known in the world. And it does this by transferring in airborne droplets, or aerosols, and comes in through the oral or, or nasal cavity, goes into the lungs. At the lungs, it actually infects your uh, immune cells first, and then they will go into the rest of your body. Then later, those immune cells will go back to the lungs, or the lymph nodes will lead to the lungs and then it'll come up through your respiratory epithelium and be released. So traffic inside infected lymphocytes, that's your immune cells, and monocytes. Uh, monocytes are, yeah, the monocytes in particular are macrophages, I believe. Uh, this will cause a fever, rash, coryza, uh, pneumonitis, uh, encephalitis, immunosuppression, uh, so you get, usually, if there's death associated, it's because of this immunosuppression, then you get a secondary infection of something. Uh, encephalitis and nidus are more uncommon. Chryza is like common cold symptoms. And the rash is the most distinctive part of the disease. In the U.S., its mortality is 0.1%. In Africa, it's about 3%. Uh, and it's largely been taken care of by vaccinations, though at the time I'm recording this, there's actually a measles outbreak in the U.S., so this number might go up, though it's, I believe it's still under 200 cases. For the measles virus infection, uh, the measles virus enters alveolar macrophages, so I was right, and dendritic cells will become infected in the lungs, they'll go to the local lymph node, that'll disseminate into T and B cells, go into the blood, uh, secondary viremia is caught by the spleen and liver because they filter all of the blood, uh, and then it'll be released from those into the lymphatic tissue, and then it'll go back to the lungs and be transmitted out of the individual. Uh, the skin rash will develop probably during the secondary viremia phase, so probably during this phase. Uh, or the primary over here. I'm not sure. Uh, the reason I say it's probably secondary is because you're going to have so much more of it. So what's the reason to change measles? One is to make a new vaccine, uh, or to make an oncolytic vector, or to combine the two. So. This is actually a great description of basic virology. When you have a wild type virus, you can think of that as like the wolf. That's the what's in nature. An attenuated virus is like domesticating a dog. Uh, attenuated strains are what's used for most vaccines. And uh, measles uses the Edmonton strain, which is uh, pretty much still used to this day. But this is a retroorbital cancer or tumor, and then uh, this child caught measles, and there was a natural regression of the tumor. Uh, it would eventually come back, but it was one of the first proofs that a virus could naturally infect cancer cells selectively. And so, in, uh, down here we have the basic idea. You can kill infected cells by oncolytic effect, uh, and then you can kill uninfected cells using the immune system's approach. So, uh, infected cells will be killed by the virus, maybe some contribution from the immune system, but there are still cancer cells left over that were not infected by the virus, and you want the immune system to clear them up. So there's four things you have to worry about when you're changing the measles virus. Safety, specificity, immunogenicity, and efficacy. So safety is you don't want to be causing any damages. Specificity is you want to target a particular tissue. Immunogenicity is, depending on what you're trying to do, you don't want to cause a cytokine storm by being too immunogenic. That means you're getting an over-response of the immune system, and you don't want it to be to so low that there's no response from the immune system. Uh, 
depending on what you want to do. Uh, if you're trying to use it as a gene therapy vector, then you would want no immunogenicity whatsoever because you don't want the immune system to stop it. And then efficacy is how effective it is at what it's doing, either at getting a gene to be targeted or at uh, oncolysis. Most of this lecture fake it focuses on oncolytics, so I'm going to focus on that. Uh, measles is not really used as the, a primary gene therapy vector, but it shows a lot of promise in the oncolytic field. So again, safety, safety, don't cause disease. Specificity, only target the cells you want, immunogenicity, get the right level of immune reaction. Uh, especially for oncolytic vectors, you want a combination approach between virus doing some of the killing in the immune system, that's that phase one, phase two from this slide. And then uh, efficacy, uh, you want it to kill the cancer cells if it's not very effective. If it doesn't have any lytic capacity, then it won't kill any cells. So how can you change the measles genome? You can either direct evolution or you can engineer it. And evolution involves mutation by its error-prone polymerase and you can select in a couple of different ways. The first is by placing it in different environments. So you can go from a human host to cell culture, and that's uh, a way that's commonly done for some other viruses. You can add or lose selective pressures. So you can add uh, some virally resistant, or some viral resistance gene, and then only uh, the copies of the virus that you get out will be capable of circumventing whatever resistance mechanism you put in place. And uh, there can be small or giant evolutionary steps. So that's not a process, it's just, it could be uh, something small, like gaining resistance to something, or giant where it completely changes the virus in some major way. So the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that measles uses is really, really error-prone, uh, 10 to the minus 3rd or 10 to the minus 6th, which compared to DNA polymerase in humans is something ridiculous, like 10 to the minus 9th, 10 to the minus 8th. So uh, comparatively, it's pretty error-prone. It's about one uh, mutation per genome. So each measles genome has at least one mutation, and uh, this estimated error of 9 times 10 to the 5th is specific for measles, and that means on average you're getting 1.43 nucleotide mutations. So at least one in every genome. Uh, measles prep is always a swarm of quasi-species. Quasi-species mean that none of them are exactly identical. Instead, they'll have a number of uh, very closely related variants. But this is not prone to recombination, so this is the only way you're getting differences. You're not, uh, for example, integrating with a host and getting new genes from that, or with other viruses. Uh, like a retrovirus uh, can end up gaining some of the genome from a different uh, ver strain of the retrovirus. Uh, so this is David Edmonston. He is the guy who they took the original measles virus from. Over a billion people have been vaccinated with it. Uh, it's never reverted. Nobody actually knows why, but uh, it's been very, very steady. There's no transmission, and the wild-type strains have not evolved uh, a way to get around the vaccination effort. Uh, which means there's some selective pressure that keeps measles easy to control. And, uh, uh, nobody knows for sure what that is. It is estimated that each vaccine strain has at least 40 mutations in both the coding and non-coding regions, and I believe that's in total. And you can see from this, uh, there's various cells that have been used, cell types, and uh, they were put in chicken embryos, so chicken embryos or chicken embryo fibroblast. Uh, and so you can get a number of different strains, but all of them have failed to revert. 
engineering. Uh, this is so. This is directed evolution by putting it in non-human host. Then you'll get it to adapt to that non-human host. Uh, and so you're just selecting with the new environment and different select pressure. Whereas in engineering, this relies on reverse genetics, point mutations, deletions, truncation, extension, uh, gene reassortment, gene insertion, and regulatory sequence insertion, gene replacement. So uh, point mutation is probably the easiest. Deletion it gets a little bit harder. Truncation is a little bit harder, but it's probably uh, you just delete out some of the gene. Extension is going to be difficult um, just because you don't know necessarily what you're messing with, but I assume people have figured that out at this point, so it's possible with measles. Gene reassortment, um, I'm not sure how that would work with measles unless this is used in a different context than like influenza reassortment. Uh, you could probably move around which gene is where to change its expression level or theoretically put a gene in between these genes. So if you wanted really high expression, you could put it in front of N. And if you want it really low, you could put it right before L. You can't actually put anything back here. Nobody's been successful in doing it. Uh, and it's not very clear why. There's probably some signal back here that tells the polymerase to stop. Uh, gene insertion, uh, that's what I just talked about. You put it in between these. Regulatory sequence, so you could put a promoter that's specific to a certain uh, cell type. And then gene replacement is like you could remove H with VSVG, which is a different attachment protein that would allow this measles virus to get into basically any cell type. So engineering measles for cancer therapy, or oncolytic virotherapy is its technical name. Uh, you arm it, so they're replacing this gene uh, with this suicide gene. You can monitor it, so this is just a gene that tells you where the virus has gone. You can image it with NIST that's uh, used in a lot of imaging techniques. So you know exactly where the virus has gone and is expressing this gene. Target the entry by changing the H. And then you can detarget, um, have detargeting microRNA. Something that inactivates the other things in this virus. So monitor, arm, target, image, and detargeting. So these detargeting microRNAs their new approach to eliminate undesired OV tropism. Uh, so you can have recombinant virus with tissue specific uh, microRNA targeted uh, normal cell. MicroRNA degrades the viral genome, but in a tumor cell, the virus will propagate. Uh, so these microRNAs provide a way to destroy uh, viral genomes in normal cells. So it's like a uh, system. It's for systemic delivery. Uh, so this is a packaging system uh, for a vector. You have a helper cell line that expresses NPL T7. T7 is promoter. Uh, and then uh, you get you transfect with plasma DNA of your construct. You have uh, the cytoplasmic T7 transcription of all of these genes, and you get their translation. Uh, and then as you start to create new copies of the genome from your DNA, you'll get simultaneous encapsidation, because it's, uh, that's how measles work. And you can get all of these to produce a progeny, uh, progeny genome that's covered by all of these proteins. Uh, you'll get transcription in the same order as normal, and measles virus and measles assembly will lead to the particle production uh, because you'll have a packaging sig signal in this based on this ACA, UGG,
So this is our case study for hemagglutinin reengineering to retarget attachment and entry. So how does measles virus attachment and entry work, and how can we retarget the process? So for the fusogenic proteins, measles F is the actual fusion protein that will, so it's this pink one, it will be the one that actually causes fusion with the host. H, however, will be the one that binds a receptor like C46 or SLAM, it will tell uh, the F protein, the fusion protein, to fuse, and this is a mechanical process that makes these envelopes in close enough contact that they become one and let the virus in. SLAM is activated, is on activated immune cells, and CD46 is ubiquitous. SLAM is the preferred molecule, I believe. So you can target Mises entry that way. So you stop it from binding the CD46 and SLAM and display cell targeting ligands instead. So you can ablate CD46 and SLAM tropisms by mutagenesis. So on the H surface, uh, this shows where different things bind. You can change those to alanine find out what they do, and then get rid of that function. And then you want to display the targeting ligand. So you can have, like here, anti-CD38 antibody uh, with SCFE. Uh, you need multiple mutations, otherwise the wild-type virus will revert back to normal. Uh, these are for the CD46 to ablate CD46 binding, these are to ablate SLAM binding. So you can screen, screen for these H mutants uh, by having cells that express all of them, or actually express one at a time and see which ones can get infected. And they'll form these syncytia, where instead of having multiple cells apart, you'll get big cells that have a bunch of nuclei. Uh, this is the results of the screening. Basically, they finally found mutations way down here at the bottom that uh, ablated CD46 and SLAM binding, but still had CD38 binding capacity and pretty efficient binding. You can construct retargeted measles uh, so you take out the H and replace it with your antibody top or uh, for whatever it is. Then you have what you need of H to continue uh, polymerase activity and replication and such. But it's really dysfunctional and only acting as part of this other country. And notably, this particular virus has GFP at the front, and that's how we detect stuff, if it's expressing. Uh, this helper cell line needs to express the uh, new receptor that you're targeting. If not, then the virus won't be able to do anything when you're creating it way back here. So the characterization of doubly abated Retargeting the measles virus, you can uh, rescue it and grow it on viral cells that are uh, CD38 positive. And uh, these are one step growth curves, which is interesting. I think the important thing from this is to know that you uh, can get this virus. Yeah, and this shows it more clearly. You have your normal measles virus as your positive control with GFP, uh, and you can see it infects pretty well. Uh, and then in uh, these CD38 targeted cells, uh, you see infection. Uh, if I remember right, minus fib means there's no antiviral, and fib 
acts as an integral. And then in the EGFR expressing cells, you can see it um, affect pretty well. And if there is no receptor on the virus cells, uh, there is a pseudoreceptor that uh, you can attach a small piece of hemagglutinin that basically overhangs and uh, can bind the pseudoreceptor, which is alpha H6 uh, SCFV. So, what's a good target? Uh, for oncolytic, and what constitutes a good turkey like uh, you want something with a decent affinity, and you want something that's very very specific to the cell type you want to investigate. So, a panel of her two SCFVs with variable affinities for an identical still. Uh, and this shows they removed and put in this uh, R2 ICFV. Uh, and then you start to see these uh, start to separate. Not sure what the difference between these two and the rest are. But the immune blotting shows the difference between the original GFP control virus and all of the other changes. So as affinity increases eventually uh, you'll get cells but you'll get cells to form syncytia but it's not a linear relationship, it's not that different. And same with density. Eventually as the density goes up, these all look very much the same. They don't increase with a greater depth. Like it's just a threshold effect. Once it happens, uh, right here, it just keeps happening. It's not more and more each time. And what ligands uh, can work for measles retargeting? You can use things like EGFR, VEGF, IGFR, IL 15. Use various antibody fragments. You can use things like SCTCR against Sire KB UPA amino terminal fragment. I have no idea what that is. Uh, an integrin is type of adhesion molecule, so you're probably just targeting that. Um, you basically put this antibody on the virus. You can add genes for cancer antigen, so it's just arming with root. Changing the code to evade antibodies so you can get deeper in the body, and then add genes for therapeutic antibodies can be optimal. Because sometimes your body won't make uh, antibodies against cancer cells. So measles is always cell associated, and so passive immunization is not protective after you start viremia. Passive immunity is when you're just given an antibody from someone rather than developing your, your own. And then you can uh, as I said change targets and then this 30 micro, micromolar affinity it's not the best, but you can uh, ensure it to about 30 nanomolars affinity.
and then uh, this particular slide I believe is uh, just showing us that the normal measles virus produces different proteins than the ones you've modified so you're getting your gene transcript of interest but you're tighter so the amount of virus you're getting is not different even with the changes that you're making uh, and this is uh, this virus is the various the first two are not really infecting but this last one is they're being infected at the same MOI so that's the same number of infectious units that you're putting on top of these cells uh -huh. so these infect these EGS ones these work pretty well at infecting so this KB OVA OVA is an antigen so this is our uh, cancer vaccine we're getting more infection here and apparently no response with OVA. This injury is dependent on the receptor den the uh, MHC receptor density. So if you can down regulate MHC, you can probably get uh, more means of virus entry. So you add this SIYR. and uh, presumably that cuts down the amount of MHC you have. You need about uh, two times 10 to the fourth cells for entry, receptors for entry. percentage of GFP cells is almost 70% so that's pretty good infection and then for ETS1 oh, I was hoping it would show uh, ETS1 is 1.7 times 10 to the 4th so in the same ballpark but at a lower uh, peptide molar we get a lower amount of infection. So if we're targeting innate immunity and apoptosis, you need to get viral invasion with this receptor mediated uncoding. Genome transcribed, viral genome is amplified, you get your assembly. genes expressed and proteins made and then the capsid will use this packaging signal represented by the square to make the virus the virus the, virus. Wow. the cellular response to infection uh, the TLRs and rigs will notice the infection the virus will have accessory proteins made that stop the downstream paths of the TLRs and rigs the cell is effectively bound and gagged uh, from being able to respond uh, and tell its friends around it that something's wrong. Caspase 3 is inactivated, inactivated so you don't get apoptosis whereas when you're making this for like oncolytic therapies you would leave this particular system intact because it might take out the cancer cell. And interferon beta, interferon uh, release is essentially the cell's equivalent to screaming that something is wrong and so you want to stop that as a virus. Uh, and that's it. Uh, thank you to Stephen Russell for making that presentation. Uh, I hope you liked it. If you'd like to see more, or uh, if you'd like to become involved in this, uh, email carrybradio at gmail.com. Thanks for having me. This has been 